Good morning, my name is Katie Gilbert and I serve as our executive pastor and we are here at Arts Camp this week. It's one of my favorite weeks here at First Church and one of the things I love most is seeing our kids so excited and so happy to be here with us each and every day. Hi, I'm Stephanie York Arnold. I'm the senior pastor here at First Church and my favorite thing about Arts Camp is the costumes. Kapow! <laughs> I'm Professor Allie B, and obviously my favorite part about Arts Camp is the opening skit every morning. I'm Super Panda, and my favorite thing about Arts Camp is the music. Come with us into Hero Hotline headquarters through the cave. Kapow! Kapow! <laughs> Welcome indeed to virtual worship here at First Church. My name is Katie Gilbert and I serve as our executive pastor and use the pronouns she and her. I have several announcements about things happening here in the life of First Church. The first up is a reminder about our July schedule for worship. Next week will be our final week uh, in the month of July as well as for combined worship during this month of July. So we hope you'll join us uh, in person at 11 o'clock for our service of music that will be hosted by The Loft. Likewise, in our virtual service next Sunday, we will be celebrating a music Sunday in the style of our Loft worship, much like we had our hymn sing, uh, hymn festival earlier this month. So be sure to tune in or come and join us in person. Beyond that, we wanna make sure that you are all marking your calendars for Sunday, August 11th. That is going to be a very big Sunday here at First Church, and we want you to come and join us. First up, we'll begin at 9.45 a.m. that morning, Sunday, August 11th, with a combined Sunday school hour. Anyone is invited to join us, whether you come to Sunday school regularly or not, as we hear from the remaining five Justice and Mercy partners who will be sharing with us about the important work uh, that our partners are doing around the city of Birmingham. Then in worship, we will celebrate what we like to call the blessing of the backpacks or lunch boxes or badges. We invite anyone who is headed back to school this fall, whether that be students, teachers, administrators, folks who work in the cafeteria or who help to keep our schools clean, whatever capacity that you are headed back to school, we want to pray for you and we want to bless the school year ahead. So we invite you to bring a representation of that to worship so that we can see it on our altars in both worship spaces. And then we want to honor you and recognize you in worship and pray for the year ahead. So be sure to join us for that. Likewise, on Sunday, August 11th, we are celebrating Bring a Friend to Church. Be thinking about someone or someones that are in your circle of influence who might be looking for a community like what we have to offer here at First Church. August 11th will be a great day to introduce them to this community of faith and to invite them to be a part, to join and to feel like they too belong here. Then last up, we will wrap up that day with a back to school bash at four o'clock p.m. This year, we will be hosting that out at the Hoover Splash Pad. So come with your bathing suit and your towel, ready to have a little bit of fun. Uh, it's sure to be a hot evening and we'll celebrate by running around and uh, enjoying the cool waters of the splash pad. There's also a pretty amazing uh, inclusive playground out there uh, at the same complex where the splash pad is. So maybe if you aren't interested in getting wet but your kids love a playground or your youth, this is a great way to come and enjoy some time together as a family of faith as we celebrate all that we have done this summer and look ahead toward the new school year and the fall. Friends, with all of these announcements shared this morning, I invite you to take a deep grounding breath and to join me being fully present in these moments of worship ahead. We rise in body and in spirit and join you in the call of worship based on Psalm 150. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. With the sound of the trumpet. Praise God with the harp and the lyre. With the trumpet. Praise God with the strings and the pipe. With the glass and the Electronic bellows, praise the Lord. 
praise God, with the 62 ranks, 3,645 pipes of the First Church Casabat organ, including 15 ranks of principal chorus stops, those foundational tones that do not sound like any other instrument. <laughs>
Please join me in our prayer of confession. God, you created a world of plenty. Yet there are children starving for food, thirsting for clean water. You created a world for peace. Yet there are children in the path of war, innocent lives lost to the violence of weapons and hatred. You created a world with time for rest, yet there are children in homes and communities so wrought with uncertainty and fear that, there, that no rest comes and sleep carries with it memories of fear. You created a world touched by your compassionate hand. Yet there are children who never hear kindness and never experience unconditional love in ways they can understand. It is our sin through what we have done and what we have left undone, what we have said and what we have kept silent that has caused your world to feel less compassionate, less restful, less peaceful and less bountiful. Forgive us. Place us back into the work of reconciling ourselves to our neighbors and this world so that we may again return to your loving creation. Friends, hear these words of assurance. Hear the good news. God offers us forgiveness beyond measure. Even though we make mistakes, God's love is unending. And each of us is a beloved child of God. Amen. I invite you to pray with me this morning. Loving God, today we give thanks for our children, for their boundless energy, for their effervescent joy, for their unending love, for their laughter, for their singing, and for their hugs. God, we know that we have much to learn from the ways that our children move through and engage with our world. Help us to see as they see. Help us to practice having faith like a child. Too often we forget or we neglect our own inner child. Remind us of our capacity to experience awe and wonder. Remind us of our own imaginations and ability to play. God, too often, this world makes us feel weary. When we do, may we then look to the youngest among us to find inspiration for what is possible when we can let go of our own rigidity and fear. When we can let down the walls of what separates and divides us as adults, when we can let go of the responsibilities that often hold us back. God, may we let our children teach us as much as we teach and nurture them. And when we aren't sure of what words to pray, remind us again of the words that Jesus taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning. At this time, I invite you to hear our scripture reading found from John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What? Are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah which is translated to anointed. 
He brought Simon to Jesus and looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law also prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Come, anything, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and ascending upon the Son of Man. This morning, as we move into a time of giving, I want to highlight one of the best things we do here at First Church each year, and that is Arts Camp. It is our children's ministry version of what many of you might know as Vacation Bible School. We do Arts Camp here at First Church, and this year we had over 75 children here at First Church, singing and dancing each morning, praising Jesus, learning stories about how to follow Jesus. Exactly this story that you just heard this morning, that is what was shared here at Arts Camp. And we had so many new families bring their children, children from our ELC, children plugged into our ch children's ministry. And we're only able to do this, to have fun, to have Jugglers come and perform for them, uh, folks from the McWayne Science Center, for them to sing, for them to do arts and crafts, for them to have great meals, to really have fun together here at church and to learn about how to follow Jesus. We can only do that and offer this ministry because of your generosity. So this morning, I want to say thank you. Thank you for being generous and call you into more generosity so that we can teach children, youth, and adults, how to better follow Jesus. At this time now, I invite you to give generously as God has created us out of a generous love. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Goss, and I serve as one of the pastors here at First Church, and I use he, him pronouns, and it is so good to be with you all in virtual worship as we celebrate our children's ministries arts camp that they have spent all week here at First Church 
learning about how to follow Jesus, having fun, singing and dancing and loving each other and being loved and welcomed by all of our wonderful adult volunteers. This morning, we are highlighting what our children have learned at Arts Camp all week, and the, their theme has been Hotline Heroes. What they have learned all week is that they, each child, individually unique, beautiful, and good, is a hero, can be a hero, just like the disciples that were called in the story that we heard from John chapter 1. Each of those disciples were different and unique, and we're going to lean into that theme of Jesus builds the team. That is our theme this morning. That was one of the themes here at Arts Camp. I personally, I love a good team. I love a good team story. I love good teams. Think of teams that are popular in today's culture or that have been popular historically. I think of the Avengers, the Marvel franchise that had Iron Man and Thor and Captain America uh, Miss Marvel eventually, these Black Panther, all of these superheroes coming together to form this wonderful team. Other teams I think of are the 1992 Men's Olympic Basketball Team, better known as the Dream Team, or the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, or the U.S. Women's Gymnastics Team. The cast from Saved by the T Bell was a great team in my opinion. Think Will and Grace, what another dynamic duo that made a great team. The list is long and could go on and on. But if I'm honest, when I really think about teams, my mind goes to sports. I played sports most of my life. I was on many teams and I learned many great and valuable lessons from those teams. My dad signed me up to play t-ball when I was four years old. Now, that was not permitted because you were supposed to be five years old to play t-ball in Macon, Georgia, where I grew up at West Macon Little League. But my dad broke the rules and signed me up to be on a t-ball team when I was four years old. And that was the first team that I remember I was on as I played sports. I went on to play baseball, basketball, football. I ran track and cross country. Like I mentioned, sports have played a vital and pivotal role in my life and taught me some great lessons that I still carry to this day. Perhaps the greatest team to ever play any team sport happened in the 1960s and 70s under the leadership of John Wooden at UCLA. The UCLA men's basketball team won an astounding 10 NCAA men's basketball championships in a span of 12 years. Y'all, that's more than Nick Saban ever won in Alabama or LSU combined. So that, that is astounding. To this day, that accomplishment has never been repeated. And in my opinion, it never will be. John Wooden is a legend. He is a legend. And one of my favorite stories about John Wooden is his approach to a team and how he coached. John Wooden was arguably coached two of the greatest basketball players to ever play college basketball. Their names are Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton. The story goes that Coach Wooden viewed himself not as a coach first, but as a teacher first and foremost. Think of our scripture that we just heard. The disciples called Jesus a teacher. He could go on to share some years later, he went on to share some years later that Bill and Kareem could not have been more different as individuals on a team. Bill was loud and energetic, wore bright colored clothing, followed the Grateful Dead and had a big shaggy head full of hair. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the polar opposite, quiet, stoic, reserved, didn't talk a lot, okay? Yet when it came to teaching them the game of basketball as a coach, he knew that with Kareem, when Kareem made a mistake at practice or in a game, he had to be loud and demonstrative in front of other players and fans and kind of get in Kareem's business. Yet when Bill Walton made a mistake in practice or in a game, he had to pull him aside. He had to put his arm around him. He had to speak to him softly to course correct. Two vastly different members of a team and two vastly different approaches to teaching people how to play the game of basketball. I believe that we can glean and learn so much 
from that story, an example of how John Wooden taught, taught his players. He taught them where they were and who they were from their lived experiences, from their diverse backgrounds, from what made them unique. I think we can learn from that as church members, as family members, as friends, as community members, because to be honest, we're all on a team. We're on a team here at church. We're on a team with our family, our loved ones, our spouses, our partners. The people we work with are on our team. Our neighbors in our neighborhood are on our team. The friends we have in life, we're all on some sort of team. And we each have different and beautiful personality traits, characteristics that make us different. And here's the catch, that makes the team better. So this morning, I wanted to not only look at the disciples that were called in the first chapter of John, but I wanted to look at all 12 disciples to talk about their differences, because I think it's important to highlight that they were different. And yet Jesus still called them to be on a team that would change the world, a team that is the reason we're here together this morning. So we're going to start with Peter, often considered the foremost and most dedicated of Jesus's original disciples. Peter represented, and this is what I love about Peter, the both and of faith that many of us can relate to. He demonstrated enormous dedication throughout his life. He was among the disciples who abandoned their occupation, in his case, as a fisherman. It says in Luke 5 that Peter left everything and followed Jesus. Peter, likewise, was the only disciple to follow Jesus out onto the stormy Sea of Galilee when he saw Jesus walking on water. But with Peter's great dedication and faith also came doubt in that story, overconfidence in other stories, and fear and hesitancy. Although he walked on water, he allowed his fears to take a hold of him, and he began to slip under Additionally, when Christ was put on trial, Peter famously denied him, knowing him to know fewer than three, knowing to do that not just once, but three times in a single night. And yet Peter went on to become the rock, as he was named in this scripture, the rock of the early church. John was another leader among the disciples. He's a well-known author, not only for the Gospel of John, but also first, second, and third books of John. He was one of the early church's leaders. John may also have written the book of Revelation, though some biblical scholars suggest that the author of this book actually was a ghostwriter for John. In any case, John is responsible for more sections of the New Testament than any other disciple. John was another of the fishermen who left their nets to follow Jesus. Together with Peter and James, John formed the inner, innermost trusted circle of Jesus' ministry. John is likely also the disciple that whom Jesus loved, mentioned several times throughout the Gospel of John. James the Greater, the brother of the Apostle John, James also was a fisherman before being called to work. James was that third member of Christ's inner circle and was active and present for most of the major events in Christ's ministry. James is sometimes also called the greater, as I mentioned, to distinguish him from the other apostle who was also named James. This basically meant that he was the older and tall or taller of the two James. Then we have Andrew. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark both place Andrew as one of the fishermen Jesus called away to follow him. The Gospel of John also states that Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist before following Jesus. Like the other disciples, Andrew worked hard to spread the gospel, the good news, throughout the remainder of his life. Philip was one of the first disciples of Jesus, having been called to work directly following Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Also, like several of the others, Philip's calling seemed to come out of the blue, with the scripture saying that Jesus went and found him, when the Savior was getting ready to leave for Galilee, which basically means he was dedicated, he was a good listener and a good follower. He was eager. He was eager to share the gospel 
And almost the first thing we learn about him is that he went and found Nathaniel, who was usually identified as Bartholomew, who would himself become one of the 12 disciples. Nathaniel, whose identity um, in the book of John is named, was a good and just man. Even before meeting Jesus, he was described as an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. And although Nathaniel was skeptical that the Messiah could have come out of Nazareth, as we heard, he was quickly converted when Jesus revealed knowledge that he could not have had access to without divine insight. And he trusted Jesus and he followed. Thomas, his primary claim to fame is that he doubted, doubting Thomas. Even when we consider how devoted he was, that is the label we place upon Thomas the disciple. The Gospel of John shares in an account near the end of Christ's ministry where it came to the intention of the disciples that certain elements in Judea were conspiring to have Jesus killed. When it became apparent that Jesus planned a journey to Judea despite the dangers, Thomas stood firmly by his side saying, let us also go that we may die with him. Talk about commitment. Talk about commitment. That said, the most memorable account of Thomas occurs after Jesus' resurrection, where Thomas refused to believe him until he had the opportunity to see and touch Christ's wounds. Matthew. Matthew traditionally is attributed as the author of the Gospel of Matthew, though many modern scholars refute this claim. Nonetheless, the Apostle Matthew was an important figure in both historically and as a disciple. It was Matthew who was willing to give up a life of privilege to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures tell us that he was a tax collector by trade, based in Capernaum and identified by using the name Levi. Although he was ostracized by his countrymen for working with Rome, he was nevertheless a man who was honest with his own heart. When Jesus called him to follow me, Matthew left everything behind. He remained true to Jesus throughout his ministry and continued to preach in different countries following Christ's ascension. Then we have the James the Less, often identified not as James the Great. James, the brother of Jesus. James, son of Alphaeus, is one of the more mysterious of the 12 disciples. All that we know for sure about him is that he was called to be an apostle and that he was present with the disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem after Christ ascended to heaven. We don't know a lot, but what we could do is read between the lines and know that he was dedicated and committed. Judas, another lesser known of the less understood apostles. Judas the Greater, also called Jude, and often identified as Theodos, is re referenced only briefly in the Bible. This meant he was either older or taller than Judas Iscariot, but also he probably didn't want to be known as Judas after the evening of the Last Supper. And then we have Simon the Zealot. Even less is known about Simon than about James, son of Alphaeus, or Judas the Greater. In fact, he's only mentioned three times throughout our Holy Scripture. Some scholars speculate that he may have once belonged to an extremist sect within the Jewish population, while others argue that zealot, in this case, merely describes his zeal and enthusiasm for Christ's teaching. And then we have Judas Iscariot, one of the most widely known apostles. Judas, his notoriety comes from his infamy rather than his virtue. Judas was the apostle that betrayed Jesus on the night and sold him into execution for a significant price of 30 pieces of silver. But perhaps... Other scholars name that Judas thought he was doing what was right and true and good. And then lastly, I want to just name that we can't kid ourselves and pretend that Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of Jesus, or Martha, that they weren't also disciples following Jesus. Mary Magdalene was once considered to be possessed and ostracized from society, yet came from some wealth. Mary, Jesus' mother, was a prophet who shared a sermon in the form of a song that highlights all of Jesus' teachings and believing. And Martha was a family friend that wept with Jesus, who was mad at Jesus, and yet who celebrated the, 
new life of her brother, Lazarus, when he was brought out of the grave. Grave. So as you can see, there were many, many disciples, followers of Jesus. And, and I just want to read a list of a list of attributes that would describe all of these people. Dedicated, devoted, overconfident, full of doubt, hesitant, leaders, fishermen, hardworking, old, young, Good listeners, followers, good and just, doubting, questioning, privilege, lesser known, well known, infamous, betrayer, prophet, angry, imperfect. And yet, they were all on the same team. You see, teams are complex, complicated. Families, churches, groups of friends, members of a working group and neighborhood, and that's, that's what makes teams great. In closing, I would like to share a video with you all from the author of Start With Why and motivational speaker and TED Talk contributor, Simon Sinek, on why teams should be full of people that are different. I invite you to watch this video with me now. I had the chance to visit the United States Marine Corps, one of their training facilities, and they run an exercise called the LRC, the Leadership Reaction Course. It's basically 20 mini problem solving courses. You know, here's three planks of wood of a different size. You have to get all your Marines and your material across the, the little pond, you know, you know, you get the idea, stuff like that. And they're timed. And because the Marine Corps has men and women, which they do it separately, they made a remarkable little, uh, they made a remarkable little discovery. Um, men fail very often because they don't spend enough time sharing ideas and planning. They execute too quickly because they're so driven to win, 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 and they don't have the right plan, so they fail, right? Women, spent more time planning and very often came up with the right solution, but they didn't leave enough time to execute, so they failed. And so it makes a case for blended teams. And this is true about anything, which is the more, the more alternative styles and alternative perspectives we have, the more creativity we, we bring to a problem. So male and female is obvious. Did you grow up rich or poor? Did you grow up in the North or the South? You know, did you grow up Muslim or Hindu? Like all of these things will change your point of view and how you see the world. And if we have different people, you know, I know the caste structure, the, the caste structure is still somewhat alive and well in India, and I know there's, we're slowly trying to break it down, but people who grew up completely differently from each other bring different ways of seeing the world, and that makes a fantastic team. That makes a fantastic team. When we have different points of view, because we have different blind spots as well, and different ways of seeing the world. So inclusion to me is about all the different ways in which people live their lives. I want them all on my team. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We are all God's family. We are special. We belong. We are not alone. And we are wanted. We are accepted. We don't have to be afraid. We are imperfect, but we still belong. We are accepted and we need not feel guilty. We can start over again. We are safe. There is meaning and there is purpose. There is always love for us. We believe God's spirit lives in each of us. We belong to God and through God, we belong to each other. Amen.
Friends and family, as you go out into the world, I invite you to go out knowing that you, yes, you, you have the capability to be a superhero. It doesn't look like what it does on the big screen or in TV shows or films or books. It's in the simple acts of loving God, loving others, loving neighbor and loving creation. That's who God has called us to be, to follow Jesus, to put others above ourselves. May we follow Jesus with the same zeal, enthusiasm, love, dedication, devotion as the early disciples did. May we do that because that's the good news. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Amen.